Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here to talk about this report. It's an initial report and it's a bit different to our normal draft report because we got it only just before Christmas and then not many people were around in January to talk about it, of course, and we were asked to construct a new metric, which I'll talk about, which should be able to... Um, which is a bit unique and uh, hopefully it will be informative and we want to run some technical workshops and to, uh, to make sure that it's improved for the final report. This is effectively a summary of the terms of reference. Uh, the, um, the study had its genesis in the um, abatement of the mining investment boom, although as I think we'll see later that it's not just about mining that's important. In fact, once we started this project, we realised that we couldn't just constrain it to areas directly affected by mining because mining is just an intrinsic part of the whole of Australia. So after that, we looked at other things as well, including agriculture and um, and uh, manufacturing and services too. The um, things that we've tried to look, the study looks through three prisms. We looked at it firstly what, what has been happening in the regions around Australia, and I'll get to what we mean by region in a second. Then we went to um, the concept of um, adaptive capacity, as Clint just mentioned, or resilience as I like to call it. And then we looked at the types of policies that might be best used by the various levels of government in Australia to improve the lot of the regions in Australia, make them efficient and uh, work together, for example. The initial report was published on the 21st of April and our final report is due in, uh, we'll publish it in December. Sorry, I'll just fix this up. There are many ways of dividing um, Australia into regions. One way would be the local government area, the LGA. Another would be linking regions by um, activities such as mining, agriculture and uh, services or manufacturing. In the end, after looking at the various options and given the amount of data that's available on this, we had to, um, we settled for using the ABS definition of a statistical area and we wanted to go down as level, the most detailed as we could possibly do. For employment, which is an indicator of how regions have been going, this is what was called the SA4 level. And uh, for um, the metric on resilience, we're able to go much more detailed to the SA2 level, which show that there are over 2,000 in Australia. For the final, we'll have to look at whether some of them should be amalgamated or not. I think it's important to note that a lot of the the metric, for example, is constructed using census data. And that, for the initial report, we've used the 2011 census, right in the middle of a mining investment boom. So the results we have are obviously quite different to the one for the census coming up in 2016, which will be published um, later this year and which we'll be using for our final report. In fact, for the final report, I want to use several censuses, not just 2011, not just 2016. So you can see a bit of a time series, if you like. And um, the 2016 census, of course, is the first one to be taken after the end of the mining investment boom. In exploring the transitioning of regional economies, we need to example, examine what is meant by resilience or adaptive capacity. This is a stylized graph, and what I tried to... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. What you want to look at here is, you can see the squiggly lines, and then there's a trend going to try and smooth it out. This shows an upturn and then a downturn. And if you take the uh, resistance line, the one that continues straight up, that is um, one that's unaffected by a negative shock. As I say, it's just stylized. A resilient one is one which goes negative for a while after the negative shock and then is able to recover. And one that's not resilient is one that obviously doesn't recover. That's just a stylized example, but I thought that was a useful way to, um, to cover it. So, we looked at, as I, those three things I mentioned, the first one is how the regions have been doing. If you look over the last five years, you'd say they're doing remarkably well. About 80% of regions in Australia have had positive employment growth. And that's a very strong message, I think, that we should take from this report. On average, employment growth across Australia's regions has been about 2% per annum, 
And, um, but what you see on the chart is it's highly vi variable. Take the one on the left there, which is shows you know, plus 10 to minus 10. That's in a five-year period, that region, and remember this is a, these are all the regions in Australia at the SA4 level, that region experienced a 10% growth in one year in employment and a 10% fall in employment in another year. Quite remarkable. If you look across Australia, here we have categorised them. The red areas are the ones with negative employment growth overall during the 20% uh, the or so of regions that had negative employment growth over the five-year period. And you can see that they're mainly in the inland areas. What does that tell you? Well, it shows that um, there's no unique issue across Australia that can be generalised, that everything's rather specific and it could be linked to specific factors. Overall, I think Australia is it's clear that Australia has benefited from the mining investment boom, but the impacts on individual regions has been disparate. The small number of regions, of course, have significant human issues that we shouldn't neglect, and the social policy side of that is something we'll look at in more detail in our final report. Um, I do caution here that it's very easy for calling for more government programs or more government money to be spent on something, but every program has both positive and negative impacts on, on regions as well as um, people. And some actually, some programs, I'm sure you can think of some, do exactly the opposite of their intent. Now we'll move to uh, population growth. Obviously, employment growth and population growth are, are related. Population can be seen here at the SA2, the more detailed SA2 level. Inland regions have been the one that have been most suffering from population decline. And that's the red areas here too. I think that brings me to a topic I'd like to talk about, one that I was involved on, migrant entry or immigration. That was a report we published last year. It's been the immigration has been the main driver of population growth in Australia in the recent years. Our population is around 23 million as it stands today. If immigration was to be stopped right now, in other words, net overseas migration was zero, we would grow to about 27 million by the year 2060. If we t continued immigration at the long-term average, I'm taking about 60 years here, which is 0.6% of population no net overseas migration each year, the population would grow to about 40 million in, by 2060. If it continued at recent levels, about 1% of, of um, population per year, it would grow to about 50 million by 2060. According to the 2011 census, most immigrants in Australia live in New South Wales and Victoria. They typically settle, settle in urban areas, with 86% 80, of immigrants living in the major cities, while only 65% of Australian-born citizens live in the cities. Together, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth account for two-thirds of the immigrant population in 2011. PC projections show that Sydney and Melbourne both would have populations of more than 7 million people by 2060, with Brisbane having 4.3 million and Perth 3.7 million. I think it's important to note that Australia is quite an outlier here. In the Europe and the United States have lots of cities of more than 500,000. We don't. The US has, US has 35 cities of more than a half a million. European Union has 63. Australia has six. Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide and the Gold Coast slash Tweed Heads. We have only 17 cities, more than 100,000 people, whereas Canada has 54 cities of more than 100,000 people. I'm not sure I have a solution to that. Uh, I'm just telling you as it is. Now let me turn to our metric of adaptive capacity or resilience. This does not predict what is likely to happen to a region. It's also likely to change, as I mentioned, for the 2016 census, which comes after the mining investment boom. But it is an indicator of how resilient a, a region is, is to negative shocks. It's a relative measure, effectively showing the regions most resilient down to those that are least resilient. 
We've used a lot of data, as you can see here, skills, education, employment, remoteness, access to infrastructure, availability of natural resources, etc., to construct this metric. And as I say, we want to um, explore it in more detail uh, through um, our consultations. Of course, a, a region with less diversification, in other words, greater reliance on a single employer, will have other things being equal, less resilience. But for some regions, it's not possible to increase the range of economic activities. I can't imagine the Pilbara having market gardens, for example. And here's, a, here's what we then published of the 2085 regions in Australia from bottom to top in terms of resilience or adaptive capacity. This is all published in Appendix B of our report um, into the four categories you see there. The least adaptive, the ones below average, the ones above average, and the top most adaptive ones. The four categories, the, the ones that are least adaptive and most adaptive are more than one standard deviation away from the mean. Now, the other thing that you notice there is quite variable too. The, um, the 90% confidence in the intervals, the vertical bars, are quite large in some cases, and um, that's why you can't treat a particular region as being a gospel that it's in a particular category. We then put the adaptive capacities onto a map, and you can see them from the least adaptive in red to the most adaptive in blue. And there are 244 in the least adaptive capacity, or 12% of all regions, and they're spread across all regions of Australia, all areas of Australia, sorry, as you can see. Factors relating to people, education, skills, employment and health strongly influence resilience, particularly for communities in the urban areas. For communities in remote areas, by contrast, these and other factors such as um, accessibility of services and infrastructure have the, the strongest influence on the index. It's not surprising that the regions with the least adaptive capacity frequently have high levels of disadvantage. Here we look at the index of adaptive capacity by geographic area. Over half of the people in the least adaptive regions reside in the greater metropolitan areas of Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide. Overall, there are two and a half million people living in the least adaptive regions. You should also note there's a disproportionate number of people living in the very remote areas which are the least adaptive. You might question, and we can talk about it later, why we include cities in regions. And um, I mean, they are part of the uh, SA2 level, so we can talk about how we should do that in the final. By looking at the data, we've ascertained some emerging themes. The, um, it's been divided amongst mining, agriculture and manufacturing. For mining overall, there's a high level of resilience and high employment growth. That said, there are some variations which I'll come to shortly. For agriculture, there's been a long-term, and not just in Australia, trend of productivity growth and high output with less employment. And for manufacturing, which of course is mainly near urban areas, there's been a trend decline in low rates of employment growth. The, um, of course, services make up a large part of our GDP, about 80%. While we've all heard about the end of the mining boom, it's notable that mining employment is higher today than in before the start of the boom. As you can see, mining employment is actually quite a lot higher than it was before the start of the boom. The standard pattern of a mining boom, high commodity prices leading to mining investment in construction, in capacity, and finally into higher production is evident in the most recent cycle, although I think both its duration and amplitude is a record for Australia. But an investment boom, of course, cannot continue indefinitely. There's also a notable dis dispersion between the different regions. Here are two, the Queensland outback around Mount Isa, and here's Western Australia. You notice the, the green line is average employment growth and for the whole of Australia, and uh, Western Australia's um, mining areas have actually grown faster than that even after the mining boom, which shows in that previous slide I showed you, but not so in Mount Isa. And why is that? In part, I think it's due to uh, end of life considerations and high cost in some of the mines in the Mount Isa region.
And what does it mean for the people? Well, look, these are house prices in some areas in, um, in the mining regions. Uh, obviously, we hear about house prices in Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane and so forth. But look at the boom that we're in these particular regions. If you take Port Hedland in um, the Pilbara, you see that median house, house prices rose from about 300,000 in 2004 to $1.2 million in 2013. That's a return of 15.5% per annum for nine years. Yet they've now fallen back to about $300,000. If you have bought a house at $1.2 million and it's fallen back to $300,000, you would know about that because you'd have a large mortgage. Um, there's a lot of sad personal stories there and, um, and it does make me wonder sometimes why do people whose remuneration depend entirely on a single employer in a single employer um, uh, town buy a the home there as well since that's a very poor diversification and, and for most people their home is the primary asset of their household. In fact, I heard a person recently who works in Canberra across from me who bought a home in, a few years ago, ago in Wyala, sight unseen. She had never visited Wyala, and maybe there's some property spruikers around or something. Sometimes I reminded, I think of the Dutch tulip bubble of 1637 when I think of that. All right, let's now talk about fly-in, fly-out workers. I think these have been a growing, a very important part of the last mining investment boom. For the investment period, there's a need for a relatively large workforce by comparison to the production phase. FIFO workers tend to spread out the impacts. If all of the employees, employees were based in, say, Mount Isa, the impact of downturn on employment would be much more stark. FIFO allows the impact to be spread to metropolitan and other areas. Of course, in balancing the use of FIFO workers, resource companies need to be aware and carefully manage the interaction of FIFO workers with the local community. This has led some companies to have fairly strict but sensible policies such as zero alcohol tolerance. As can be seen from the chart here, a significant number of persons working in the mining industry in WA were FIFO workers living in Perth or Peel. So, for example, 69%, you can see there the Perth Metro on the um, third column, 69% of the mining industry workers lived and worked in the Perth metro area, while 25% lived in Perth and worked in the Pilbara, Kimberley and the Goldfields. So FIFO is, is a critical part to that story and we will look at it in more detail. Now, I mentioned about agriculture and its employment. This is a long-term trend and you can see the persons employed as um, both a percentage of the workforce overall and employed directly uh, in numbers on the left-hand side in the green, and that's a lot of falling employment. It's a trend you can observe in Europe, Canada, and the United States as well, and other countries, reflecting productivity growth in agriculture where output continues to grow even though fewer people are employed to produce that output. It's had profound impacts on our towns. Whereas once settlement might be separated by a comfortable distance for a horse and buggy, over time regional towns have grown, although not to the extent seen overseas. As you can see when I gave you the example of how, many, how few cities we have more than 100,000. I don't think that trend's going to change. There's no reason to suspect it will. Over time, this has led to lost towns. These are all the dots that you can see on that gra uh, map there or ghost towns as populations consolidate to larger towns. Numerous locations that, localities that were enumerated as towns in both 1911 and 1961 censuses, with a population of at least 500 in either census had populations of less than 200 by 2006. And that affects the social fabric of communities. One example of that is uh, the number of football clubs or the decline of football clubs Here's an example in part of Victoria. Sport, as you know, can play an important part in the social and cultural life of communities, contributing to community identity, sense of place, social interaction and good health. These closures are all due to population decline, which also causes other activities to move away from those towns or regions. Of course, here in Cairns, you have a reasonable population growth, but are naturally dependent on tourism, which can be volatile. 
Cairns has also been indirectly affected by the mining boom due to the um, appreciation of the Australian dollar, making it more expensive for tourists from overseas to visit Australia. Of course, you do have a good product to sell. And the exchange rate has depreciated recently, so as you would expect following the end of the boom. But I should say that the exchange rate is a critical shock absorber, along with a flexible labour market, to reduce the negative impacts of booms and busts. I'll give you a simple example. In 1951, there was a Korean War wool boom, and uh, sheep were being driven around in Rolls Royces. There was a major jump in Australia's terms of trade, and because we had a fixed exchange rate, it flowed straight through to inflation, which persisted for a couple of years at over 21% or 20% or thereabouts, and it had some quite profound impacts. I don't want to specifically talk about manufacturing today, so I'll move now to policy. And of course, we'll examine policy in more detail in our final report. It's worth noting that regional programs are to be found at all levels of government, federal, state, territory, and local, and they have not always been well coordinated. In fact, sometimes a federal program works in the opposite direction to a state program. That's not very helpful. Given that we examined resilience, it made sense to consider policy options in the framework. Here we have used the vertical axis for the type of change or shock. The higher up the axis, the more unforeseen, permanent or stronger is the shock. On the horizontal axis is the resilience from the least adaptive on the left to the most adaptive on the right. So tier one regions, in the bottom right hand corner if you like, are those most capable of adapting and least likely to have large permanent negative shocks. Tier 3 regions are the ones that are least resilient and likely to face very intense shocks. Overall, we see a benefit in universal no regrets reform, in other words, reform that you should pursue in any case, that has no negatives, that would be inform the removal of regulatory obstacles, for example, to mobility of people and business activity. I'll spruik our regulation of agriculture inquiry, which I was involved in, which covered a large number of such no regrets policies in areas such as land use, planning, zoning, development assessment, conflicts between farming and residential land use, environmental regulation and approvals, on-farm regulation of water, technologies such as agricultural chemicals and pesticides, where Australian farmers are often not able to use um, new products which have been authorised by a, a very strong regulator overseas, transportation of heavy vehicles and farm vehicles where there can be very onerous paperwork and delays in getting permits, regulations of rail, ports and coastal shipping. I mean, coastal shipping is appalling some of the um, problems there which make it very costly and much more costly to move um, product from one um, city to another in Australia than across to Beijing or something. Labour market regulation, seasonal workers and working holiday makers, export regulation and others. I mean, I don't think it needs me to say, but I would say that regulation should only be brought in when it has a net benefit to the community and should be designed to put the minimum burden on the producers and consumers consistent with achieving an objective, its objective. And I think sadly it's not often the case. Um, sadly it's often the case that we don't have such regulation. We also think it's important that regional strategies are identified and led by the local community. Local leadership is vital and, and that should be in partnership with all levels of government. Importantly, regional strategies should be closely aligned with the region's relative strengths and targeted at developing the capability of people to deal with change. Programs should also be designed with clear objectives and measurable performance indicators and subject to rigorous evaluation. Regrettably, many programs are not evaluated. And I cannot overstate the importance of good pro program project selection. A dollar spent on a project is a dollar not available to another project. This is particularly important for infrastructure, which has long, large upfront costs and provides services for many years. Infrastructure can have extraordinary long life. Construction of Rome's Cloaca Maxima, its sewerage system, commenced around 600 BC during the reign of Tarquinius Priscus, the fifth king of Rome. It's still being used today. Madrid's Ciudad Real Airport, which I saw once, was built in 2008 at 1 billion euros cost and closed four years later in 2012. Bad project selection, a white elephant.
We also discussed in the public infrastructure inquiry report the financing, the initial capital, and funding, such as tolls, of major infrastructure. There's a place for both government financing and private financing, but critically, all major infrastructure projects should be subject to thorough and transparent cost-benefit analysis. By publishing the methodology and the assumptions used in the analysis, those not conflicted or not involved with project as pro project proponents can analyse the reasonableness of the assumptions and met methodology. Involving the private sector through public-private partnerships, for example, has been popular over recent years, but they're not new. And here are just a quick example where there's a temple of Zeus here that I visited in 2011, and there's um, Robert Pitt there, who's an epigraphist, who's showing me the um, contracts between a consortium of city-states, Corinth, Thebes, Athens and Boeotia, and private contractors to build the temple. Uh, regrettably, he hasn't been able to find a cost-benefit analysis of said temple. But it did have um, uh, bonuses for exceeding deadlines, penalties for not meeting deadlines, quality standards and how the works would be assessed and when the ownership would transfer from the, um, the project constructors and finances to the consortium. That was in 338 BC, so there you are. Some things don't change. Now, excuse me. What will we do from now? We've, of course, published this report. We've got a fair while now till December. The out, obviously, 2016 census will come out in, I think, um, October or thereabouts, and we'll use that. And we want to consult widely around the community um, across Australia as to this report and how we can um, formulate good advice for the government, not just the federal government. Um, submissions have been invited. I think we've got the end of July as the date and we'll hold town hall meetings and other consultations. And that's about it. Thank you very much for everyone.